Welcome back everybody and welcome to another In Conversation session. Um, I'm delighted to share an interview with you now that I did with Tracy Goodwin, who's one of our patient partners for the Legs Matter Coalition. Um, Tracy talks about her experience of living with a leg ulcer and how this experience inspired her to become a patient partner of our campaign. Uh, unfortunately, Tracy won't be able to join us for the live Q&A session at the end. However, I will be available just to read any comments or to if you have any comments you want to make or any questions that I might be able to, to answer. So um, over to, to you now. Uh, please pink with the, with the interview video. Thank you. Hi there everybody, my name is Sarah Gardner, I'm a trustee for the Tissue Viability Society and I'm one of the Legs Matter Coalition members. Uh, welcome to another Conversation with Session and I'm delighted today to be joined by Tracy Goodwin who's one of our patient partners for Legs Matter. Um, hi Tracy, how are you doing today? Hi, uh, yeah I'm fine, thank you, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, right, so I've got a, just you know, a few questions really to ask you and um, you know to me you are such an important member of our group but I know that you've you know you've had a journey in terms of leg ulceration you've suffered with leg ulceration in the past would you mind just sharing um, your story around your leg ulcer with us? Yeah absolutely fine um, so when I was 20 um, I was pregnant with my son um, I suffered with a deep vein thrombosis and then I suffered with another um, deep vein thrombosis just after he was born um, so those two blood clots actually left my veins um, quite delicate and the skin around my ankle very delicate um, unfortunately a few years later I knocked my ankle um, and the sore first started I didn't know anything about leg ulcers at the time so I just thought I just sort of banged my ankle didn't think anything of it um, and then it just didn't heal so I had been to the pharmacist um, and that was just given some dressings actually to start with. Nobody suggested at that point that it could be anything else other than a cut. Um, it was sort of leaking into my shoe quite a lot. So I was quite concerned about it. I think it was a couple of months before I then went to the GP. And luckily the GP referred me straight to the um, leg ulcer clinic up at the hospital. Um, and that's where my journey sort of began with a leg ulcer, which as I say, I'd never heard of before. Um, I was told at the time it would heal within about 12 weeks, which seemed like a lifetime at the time. Um, obviously, at this point, um, I had a young child um, and it seemed like it, it seemed like an endless amount of time to have a sore on your leg, really. Um, it did heal that first one within about 12 weeks. Um, and then following that, I fell pregnant again a few years later. And when my second child was about 18 months old, I knocked my ankle again. As I say, the, the paper. I sort of paper thin skin around my ankle so it was easily easily done um and I, I wasn't aware that I had to sort of protect my ankle in the way that I know now um so I think I've become a little bit complacent um and I did knock my ankle again and that time it the ulcer came back it grew very quickly it got infected and that ulcer stayed with me for around 15 years it must have been a really difficult time for you interesting what you said about not recognizing that you had a leg ulcer it isn't a terminology that people would use they would see it as a wound on their their legs what was um what was the lowest part of that journey it sounds like you you've been through quite a lot with your leg ulceration was there a real low point i think the lowest point for me was just the amount of pain i was in um i had times when the pain was bearable and times when it, it was it, it was really hard to live with. Um, I was on a lot of pain relief. Um, there were times that it was so bad I could I could hardly even get upstairs. So I was sleeping downstairs for about 18 months. Um, as I say, I had two quite young children at this time. I wasn't sleeping properly. And obviously pain just has an effect on every part of your life in ways you wouldn't imagine because it's difficult to carry on your daily routine being in that amount of chronic pain. Um, so it would affect my sleep pattern, it would affect my diet and obviously led to me putting weight on. Um, it affected my, my confidence, my career path, um, our finances, my relationships with people, um, my social life, just, just every part of your life you can imagine. Um, and I think that at times was really, really hard to deal with the chronic pain and all the impact that it has on every part of your life. 
Was the pain aspect um, dealt with, do you think, in a, in a proactive way? I know from my experience of talking to people with leg ulceration, pain does feature as one of the worst things. Um, but it doesn't seem to be managed well by the clinicians that maybe are, are seeing you. Did you feel that that was the case? You know, what was tried? Do you, do you feel that the needs to be more learned about pain, that the pain that people are experiencing? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, um, I was quite lucky. And if I said that I don't think these pain killers are enough for me anymore, um, something else was always tried, something different. And we did try various things. I remember once going to the pain clinic um, at the hospital. Um, I can't remember the name of it, or what it was, but there was some sort of um, injection they did into my back um, to try and stop the pain. That didn't work for me, unfortunately, um, but they definitely tried different things. And I, I once tried um, a, a different type of pain relief that worked in a different way. I think it interfered with the um, receptors that go, I think it was called amitriptyline or something like that. Um, and again, that wasn't really for me, um, but I definitely was given the opportunity to try different things. Um, I was on slow release morphine, uh, which I was taking twice a day. I was on um, ibuprofen, which I was taking sort of every four hours. Um, and I was also on liquid morphine as well for when the pain got really bad. Um, it's not ideal when you've got young children, because I found that if I sat still for any length of time, I would be quite drowsy. Um, but unfortunately, I had to take that amount of pain relief just to get through the day um, to be able to take the children to school and, and carry on with everyday life. Sounds like, yes, it's been a, a really difficult time. And, and I think there's, there's still lots to learn about pain, I think, in, in leg ulceration. Um, so you're healed now, I believe. Uh, what, what's helped you heal? What was it specifically, do you think? Um, I think because I was lucky enough to be treated by um, a, leg, a leg ulcer specialist, um, a vascular nurse that knows exactly what she's doing, um, because she is, that's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to word it, because um, she is a specialist in her field, she has access, I think, to lots of new um, therapies and new treatments that are coming out. And we have tried a lot over the years, you know, every new thing that came out, she would sort of say, do you want to try all this? Do you want to try this? Um, we'll put you on this trial or this trial. And we've tried everything. Um, and it was it was one particular treatment that did work for me. But that was alongside um, using debridement to make sure the wound was clean. Um, obviously, keeping up with compression, um, elevating my legs whenever I was sat down, um, exercising when I could, um, trying to follow a healthy diet. There was a lot of things that went alongside it. So I don't think it was just purely down to the treatment. Um, but I think it was a case of just trying, trying things because not all treatments work for all people. So it's about stepping forward and saying, can we try something? No, I don't think this is working for me. And I do believe that every patient should have that option to be able to see the right person, the specialist, and, and get access to those same kind of treatments. I would imagine that um, you you gained quite a good relationship with that person. Um, do you think that's quite important, that sort of patient clinician relationship in, in helping you move forward with your, your treatment plan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, it was really important that she understood um, that I had a young family. That was the main thing. So that instead of just giving me, uh, oh, your appointment time is at this time next week, she'd say, well, what's best for you? And quite often I would come in at eight o'clock in the morning um, and, and be her first patient so that we could sort of move forward and, and work around each other. Um, the other thing was because we had um, a good relationship, um, she introduced me to kind of doing some self-care at home. And then she was sort of always at the end of the phone um, or I could contact her by email and send her photos if there was any issues that I was concerned about with my leg, if there were any changes. I could just get in touch with her and then she'd either say, well, look, try this, or she'd say, come up and see me at the clinic. So that worked out well for me and saved me an awful lot of time, really, hanging around hospitals with the children or trying to fit it around school times. Um, and also we run our own business, so it was it was useful to be able to fit it around our work life. Yeah, I, I think uh, this certainly this last couple of years during the pandemic, there's been a real push to sort of have that rather than just self-care, it's sort of shared or supported self-care. Um, there's some real benefits of that. And I think that's 
becoming very evident now. Um, you know, we talk about the, the expert patient and it sounds like, you know, that's what you've become. But I think we sometimes disempower people. You know, there seems to be this assumption that the clinicians have to deliver the care. But I think you've demonstrated the real benefits of having that supported shared care. So that's a really great example. Do you think um, your experience, Tracy, has changed you or as a person or have you grown as a person? What 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 has this experience sort of taught you, do you think? I think one of the main things it's taught me is to try and look at the positives because I think it would have been very easy for me to um, slip into depression with the ways that it was affecting my life and out my whole family's life, really. Um, you know, if I sat and thought about, well, I can't do this anymore and I can't do this, I can't go there, I can't work, you know, I can't go and do this for my career, we haven't got any money, you know, all those things, they're awful things and they affect a person's life so much. But for me, I, I found it useful to think, well, it could always be worse. So I would think about the poor patients that were in my situation that didn't have a supportive family or didn't have good care. Um, and that would make me realise that actually, yeah, this is happening to you, but you're quite lucky. You're lucky because you've got someone that looks out for you and that, that, that knows what they're doing. And I had such consistent care all the way through that I knew I could trust, trust her 100 percent. And I knew that whatever new thing she was trying was always for me. Um, and she wasn't just sort of fobbing me off with this and, and trying to get rid of me out of a clinic. You know, I knew that she had my best interests at heart. And also my family have been amazing. So to think of poor people that live alone um, and have to go all through that and that amount of pain with no support um, kind of made me always try and look at the positives. I think, you know, you're truly inspirational, Tracy. And I think, though, you know, what you've just said will give people hope. Um, I think there'll be many people out there in despair, really, with, with their situation. Um, and I think you just demonstrated the importance of trying to stay positive because, yes, it will impact massively on, on your life on, and every bit of your life, doesn't it? So thank you for sharing that with us. That's really important. Um, so you're a patient partner for the Legs Matter Coalition for that we're extremely grateful and you know you you basically keep us you know the focus on on patients within the group because I think it's quite easy for us as clinicians to be very clinically focused and you sort of bring patient centeredness back into the room so thank you for that so what was it that inspired you to become part of the Legs Matter Coalition as a patient partner? I think it's like what we were just saying about other patients that aren't as fortunate um when I hear about patients that have gone through a similar um, leg ulcer situation or experience to me, but um, have had such terrible care, inconsistent care, people that have been passed from pillar to post and no, no, never really seen that specialist that I had access to. I just want to help make sure that there's a, a good standard of care across the board, you know, no matter where you live, um, no matter what your situation, that everybody who finds himself in this situation gets the same care um, so for me that was really really important and I think the clinicians as wonderful as they are they haven't got that lived in experience of having a lower leg condition um, so they there's some things that I'll, I'll say to, to certainly to my nurse that always sort of treated me and she just, it's something that she would never have thought of just just little things of how it can affect your life that as a clinician I think unless you've actually experienced it you can never realize that that could affect you in that way Yes, and I, and I I absolutely agree, and I think um, you know you you're really good at that because sometimes we make assumptions I think about what patients will want or they need or how they feel, but unless you've lived that experience, as you say, we we can't understand that. <clears throat> Excuse me, and and you definitely bring that to the table. So. Um, so your role within the campaign, what is it specifically that you do? I mean, you've talked about sort of, you know, being there as our advisor. Uh, and I know I've seen you at multiple conferences speaking. So, so you know, how do you feel about that? But is that something that you've done before? Or, you know, how do you feel about doing things like this today? Um, <laughs> well, I was very nervous to start with um, when all this came about, Um when I was first asked to speak at a conference, you know, I hadn't done any public speaking since I was at school in front of a class full of people. I had never stood up in front of hundreds of people and, and spoke, especially about something that was so emotional to me. Um, so I know for the, for the first few years when I did the conferences and I just told my story, I would end up crying. And Leanne, who's my vascular nurse, would end up crying. 
and half the audience would be in tears um, because it was hitting people in a way that they weren't used to. Um, but for me, that was really important because it was about un understanding the patient, not just when they come to you in the clinic and you see them for 15 minutes, but to see how it affects their life when you're not there as a clinician. So uh, for me, it's just really important that I bring that patient experience, like you said, to make the clinicians really see all the ways in which it can affect your life. Um, as a patient around the legs matter table, you know, I'm treated as an equal, um, which is really nice for me. And it was something I was concerned about to start with. Um, but that's, it's always been the case that I'm always listened to and my opinions are always taken into account. So it's something that I really enjoy doing. And I feel like I'm respected and, um, you know, people are grateful for me to be there as, as a patient representative. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with that. Um, so this year's message for our awareness week is about taking back control or giving <clears throat> people the power to to make a difference to their lives in terms of their lower limb conditions. You know, wh why is this an important message, do you think? I think it's vitally important that patients feel that they have a choice, that they have a say in their care. Because you can tell people until you're blue in the face that you must wear this or you must try this. But if it's not working for them for whatever reason, it's about getting to the bottom of why that particular treatment's not working and, and then trying something different because it has to fit in when it's a long term condition like that. It has to be something that the patient can manage um, because if they can't manage it, then they can't continue with their life. And if, for instance, if they were put into compression, I mean, the experience I had with compression bandaging was that it really didn't work for me as an active young mum. And so when I um, changed to the stocking kits, to the hosiery kits, um, they worked so much better for me. And in turn, that meant that I could get shoes that fit proper, properly and that I could actually get out and at that time, not very much walking, but I could do some walking, which I wasn't able to do before because the bandages would always just slip down. So obviously then that leads to better things. So to get the right treatment means that you can get those other things into your life like exercise and a positive attitude and then that in turn will lead to better success of the care yeah I, th I think you know it's, it's really important isn't it that we have individualized care and I know that there are standard sort of evidence-based treatments but you know I think you've just demonstrated there that you, you need to be adapting that to the individual person's needs. As you said, you were a young mum, you know, I'm sure you didn't want to be um, having, you know, four layer bandages that would have been difficult. Um, so, so I think, you know, as the message really needs to be to clinicians that we do need to adapt treatment for individual needs. I think that as, as a patient though, Tracy, um, there might be situations where that is difficult or some people might find it difficult. You know, we're given these messages today saying you don't need to put up with this. You need to recognize this is not normal. Um, this has been going on maybe for months. So you need to address it somehow or challenge the care that you're having. I would imagine that would be quite difficult for some people. Do you, do you agree? And have you got any sort of tips as to how you would discuss this with your clinician or challenge the care that maybe you feel is suboptimal? Yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of people would find that difficult. And I think if I had not had the relationship that I had with my clinician, I would have found it difficult to suggest other things or can we try this? Um, I know I was very fortunate there. I think a lot for a lot of patients, they, they trust the clinician 100% and they wouldn't dare question the care that they're getting. But I think it's, it is really important either with the support of a family member um, or with the help of a, a different clinician, so the GP to, to intervene. I think it's really important that people do ask, is there anyone else I can see? Is there a specialist? You know, can I speak to somebody else? Or even something they may have seen on the Legs Matter website, you know, take, mm -hmm. print it in, print it off. So we take it in and say, look, it says here, that this should be happening at this point, and I don't feel that it is. Um, hopefully, with with everything that all the good that Legs Matters doing, and the more awareness it raises, it will become easier for patients to do that. Yeah, and this is why I think uh, events like this week, you know, the Awareness Week, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's raising that awareness, signposting people to our website where there will be the information they need 
to, as you said, to take to that clinician to say, this is what should be happening at this stage. This isn't right. I should be healed by now or I should have seen a specialist by now. So I suppose it is that message, isn't it? Take, having the power to do that or taking back control. So mm-hmm. looking back at your journey, Tracy, um, what would you have said to yourself then based on what you know now? I would I would simply say just to stay positive. And I know that's something that I said I, I did anyway. And I think to an extent, you know, having a young family did help me do that because it meant that I couldn't sort of just wallow in self-pity. I had to get up. And for some people, that that's because they have to go to work. Some people, it's because they've got other people to look after. And sometimes it's, it, you know, it's it, people have commitments. And I think it's really important that, you know, they're enabled to get up and still continue with their lives as much as they can. Um, but I would just say to myself, you know, there will it will heal because that's certainly at one point, you know, when I wasn't sleeping and I couldn't walk more than a few steps, I just thought, how is my life going to be? I mean, at one point I did go to the doctors and I was begging them to amputate my leg because it was that bad and I couldn't see a way out. I just thought I'd rather learn to live um, without a leg than have this pain for the rest of my life. I mean, thankfully for me, I was referred to an, to an operation in London where they did a vein transplant and that actually helped a lot with the with the constant throbbing pain that I was getting. Um, so I, I was fortunate with that. Um, but I, I would just tell myself, just stick with it. And, you know, to think now that I'm sleeping really well, I'm, I'm walking miles every day with the dogs. Um, you know, my life's not perfect because I've not been able to have the career that I wanted to have when I was in my early 20s when all this started. But, you know, when I look back, I have a so much better quality of life than I had then. So um, if you were just to have give us a couple of words or a statement to sum up, really, the message to people out there similar to yourself, what would your final words be to them? To take control. I know that's the tagline of this year's Awareness Week. But really look at what you can do to improve your general health. Um, You know, look at what you should be doing, but also take control of your care and and speak up, really. If something's not working for you or if you think that your care is not sufficient, then find the courage to be able to speak to your clinician and, and, and really tell them how difficult you're finding things. Brilliant. Tracy, thank you so much. I think I think that will resonate with a a lot of people listening to this today, uh, and I'm sure it will help their journey considerably. So thanks for sharing. And thank you again for being such a brilliant patient partner for our coalition. And uh, yeah, I will speak to you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and by the way, the comedy moment happened. The L fell off the wall. So if anyone spotted that, well done. And uh, luckily, we (laughs) we managed to contain ourselves because I saw it and thought it's happened so that's just a little bit of comedy as well but thank you so much and uh speak to you soon bye bye thank you Tracy um the the comedy moment in case you're wondering what that was was when we pre-recorded this um I had an L on the wall it's back there now pretty much super glued on and we had a conversation before we did the recording that um I had just some sellotape holding it up and I said I hope the L doesn't fall off the wall because you know you see this happening don't you on these sort of comedy clips you know like in a tv studio and something a sign falls off the wall or something anyway while I was um talking to or Tracy was talking to me uh, and it was obviously there's been quite a lot of emotion hasn't there during this conversation and I could that the the L slipped off the wall and you know when you're trying to sort of just maintain that serious look on your face she hadn't noticed and and I'm not sure whether anyone picked up that the L was there at the start but not at the end so that's what we were talking about so um as I said unfortunately Tracy can't join join us for this sort of live uh, Q&A session but I think you'll probably admit that that was pretty humbling, wasn't it? Listening to Tracy's story um, and how that's impacted on her personally. You know, I think um, it's bad enough, isn't it, that people experience the symptoms, the wound symptoms, uh, the pain, the smell, et cetera, et cetera. But actually sort of the the wider impact on, on relationships and aspirations, you know, Tracy talking about not being able to pursue the career that she had hoped to have because of having leg ulceration at such a a young age and having to to deal with that with young children um, it's really significant so um, 
let's have a look in the uh, uh, the if there's any questions here. I think I did see some come in. So, um, as a coalition member, what do you feel that having patient partners like Tracy have added to the campaign? So that's a really good question, and and I think. There, what they what patient partners bring is is the honesty and it brings us back down to earth with a bit of a bump in terms of um, I think as clinicians sometimes we can make assumptions about what people want what patients need or what they want or what you know when we're designing services we we assume that this is what patients need this is what they want this is what we'll do um, and and when we have those discussions, our patient partners say, no, 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 that 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 won't work, or or you know, so so it it adds that context really, that real life context to it, and I think it stops us making assumptions. So that's absolutely brilliant. I think it also gets us to think about the language that we use and the terminology that we use. Um, again, we're really bad at that. I think what was really um, I think quite shocking for us is in one of the meetings that we had, we were talking about um, non-concordance or non-compliance. It was just because this, that terminology is battered out, isn't it, all the time. And Tra Tracy just was absolutely confused and she went, I really don't know what you're talking about. So um, we explained that patients are are sometimes labelled because that's what it is, isn't it? It's a label put upon a patient if they haven't been wearing their compression bandages or they're not been elevating their legs or whatever, for whatever reason. And that is documented sometimes in notes. I've seen it and I've seen GPs write statements to patients saying that, you know, view the non-concordance, we won't be able to actively do this or whatever, but patients are labelled. And she didn't even know that that actually was even something that we would be using. Didn't understand it, didn't realise, you know, and, and it's often, isn't it, the, the non-concordance. OK, we label people with that, but actually it's because the bandages don't suit her. We talked about individual needs. Um, it's too painful. It's unbearable. Um, it doesn't fit with her lifestyle. And it's it's not that she's not concordant. It's just it 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 is not good for for Tracy or other patients. So, so that was really interesting conversation. It's got us to really think about sort of language and terminology that we use. Um, so, um, I I just think it's just we it, it's just the best thing to have. And I know that in a lot of clinical areas they have patient groups, and sometimes it can become, from my experience, a bit of a tick box. So we've got to have patient representation. You know, this is not just about representation. This is about an equal footing and a contribution to a really important campaign. Um, so we are very, very, you know, humbled that we have people like Tracy um, on our group. Um, is the Legs Matter campaign looking for other patient partners and what sort of people are you looking for? Certainly, you know, we're always really interested in people who would be um, keen to join our campaign. Um, and that might not necessarily be that, you know, you would, you would want to be an active uh, partner like Tracy. However, you know, it could be that you could become a real champion for us or an advocate for the campaign. So if you are interested um, and, you, you know, you've experienced some sort of lower limb uh, condition, whether that be lymphedema, whether it be foot problems or, or leg ulceration um, please do get in touch and if you go onto the website you can um, you can contact us via uh, email um, and that you know it'll come to 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 us as a coalition and uh, we'll have a conversation so yes please if you're interested do get in touch um, how can people who are interested in supporting the campaign from a patient perspective get in touch so I've just I've just you know, via our website and uh, drop us an email. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And also, you know, any experiences that you've got, good or bad, hopefully a positive, we're really, really keen to share stories to inspire others that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And, and um, you know, you know, I, th I think it's really powerful. I think that's just been demonstrated today. It's really powerful, isn't it, when people tell their stories? Because sometimes I think people, people experiencing these problems feel quite alone. Um, but 
when you come together and you hear other people talk about it, um, hopefully that will give you hope. Um, how does make how does it make you feel as a clinician when you hear Tracy's story? I'm always really emotional. I mean, I never get tired of listening to Tracy. She's such an, a fantastic speaker, and she's just so honest. Um, and and it really it it does just put everything back into perspective as to why we're doing this. And it just gives me hope that you know after several decades of frustration that lower limb conditions don't seem to be getting any, any better you know we're not improving care <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> i just think that um, this campaign with support from people like tracy <coughs> excuse me um is is improving that and i think this awareness week the activity on social media the attendance at our sessions just really demonstrates that people now are interested in this and improving care so um yeah it's it's it makes me proud, really. So that's that's brilliant. Um, anything else in that? Uh, I think that's it. So really positive comments um, for, for about about Tracy and and her honesty. Um, so yeah, that that's there's nothing else in there. And I hope you've enjoyed that and got a lot from it. Um, and uh, thanks again to Tracy. And the next session now will be coming up at seven o'clock this evening. We've got a session on the importance of mobility in the lower leg and foot, foot health with Frank Campbell. So I hope you can join us for that. And uh, thank you for joining us. Cheerio then.